will probably want to go through this multiple times. But let's, is there anything, just while I got you guys, since we don't have meetings super regularly right now, anything that you guys have questions about or anything you want to hit real quick before I get into this? Cool. All right, sweet. Then let's get into it. All right, the ins and outs of the life insurance, health insurance industry as a whole, as seen by me, Justin Thomas, now going by Justin Falk of Insurance Advertising Masters. All right, so big thing to note just before we get into this is that the industry is changing. No, very slowly. The insurance industry is an industry that doesn't move at a fast pace. It's typically like five years behind everything else, but it is changing. However, this is a snapshot of how I've seen it from the past decade that I've been a part of it. So everything that's happened for the last 10 years. So 2013, 2014 to now 2023. So that's what this presentation over is a snapshot of how I viewed the industry over the last decade. So what are we going to cover in this video? And really by the end of this video, you'll have my full understanding of the insurance industry. And it should give you guys a good guidance, especially as you're like getting on these calls, talking to insurance agents every single day of, of just like what's going on. And a lot of times, so after this video, you will have more information about the industry than most likely 99.5% of insurance agents. And that's because I'm going to give you guys insights into the industry of multiple different sections. So we're going to be covering what it's like uh, as a life agent, as a Medicare agent, as a health agent, as an annuity agent, because those are the main four things that we help. And most of the agents that you talk about, or talk to, they may know a decent amount about their industry, but they're not going to know much about the others. And so you guys are going to have the full picture, but you're also probably going to know more than 90, 85 to 90% of the people that you're talking to about their own industries. Because oftentimes just the way that this, the insurance industry has been built is that a lot of stuff is kept quiet or not publicly discussed. And really the only way that I've come about it is through talking to thousands of insurance agents. The first two years of my career, I literally lived in the Facebook groups. So while agents would be commenting in there, I would just sit in there for days, just reading everything, understanding as much as I possibly could. And I would say that that's like, where I got good at marketing as well too, because I could see everything that was happening and understanding all of this helps me get inside the heads of the people that we're marketing to and that you guys are gonna be talking to on a daily basis. So in this video, we're gonna start at the top, which is the insurance carriers, the insurance companies. Then we're gonna cover what's captive versus independent. Then we're gonna cover the types of products and how the agents think. So what's going on in their head, how they think about everything. Then we're going to cover IMOs, FMOs, large agencies, NMOs, MGAs, GAs. We guys will figure out what those are. Some of you guys have, may have heard of those words. Uh, some may be brand new to you, but it's going to be good to, to just have some of that lingo. And then multi-level marketing in the insurance industry. This is not the whole industry, but we're going to cover like who to keep an eye out for, or who to take with a grain of salt when you're talking to them. And then we're going to cover the downline upline recruiting model versus what I call the real business model, uh, which is like employee agents. And then a term called LOAs, which you'll hear a ton on if you're listening to calls that have been performed in the past. And you'll probably use it when you are talking to agents, but it just stands for licensed only agents. Some agents really know it and they use the term a lot. Other agents have never heard of it. Other agents have been turned into an LOA. They've been contracted as an LOA, not knowing it. And so they hate the word. So we'll kind of get into that um, as we get along. And then an in-depth product breakdown and how much the agent should get paid because they don't always get paid or compensated in the way that they should. And then some marketing options available that agents may have tried up to this point. So a key thing to know as we're going through this, again, this is a snapshot of how I view the industry as a whole. It doesn't mean that every single person inside of it subscribes to everything that I'm saying. They are mass stereotypes. A lot of people fall into these. But the key caveat to know is that the agents that win and will continue to win will not fall into these mass stereotypes. They will have the best pieces 
of of some of like of all of it and they'll also have an open mind to understand the best pieces of what we talk about today and what is working so just a key key thing to note all right so who's at the top the insurance carriers or if you've ever heard of an insurance company that's different than an insurance agency or an insurance broker but the most common term is an insurance carrier so they're at the top they're the ones you know that exist the insurance industry exists because of of them so um the insurance carriers the insurance companies this is the extent of what most of the public knows or thinks about when they think about the insurance industry uh about the actual oh there we go okay so what i mean by that is if you go and ask a random person on the street you know what do you think about the insurance industry they're going to say oh like you're talking about like new york life or geico or state farm like that's the extent of of what they know they don't really get into or have knowledge of like the inner workings of agents and agencies and marketing and all of all the stuff that we're going to cover today. Uh, but without the actual insurance companies and carriers, there wouldn't be an industry because they're the ones that make the products. They're the ones that create the life insurance, create the health insurance. That's what they do. Uh, I don't want this to be like a fully academical presentation where I'm, I'm like giving you guys all the stuff you would need if you were getting licensed as an insurance agent, but effectively insurance companies sell risk mitigation uh you don't really need to know more than that but they create products that mitigate risk and you know i'm not saying this but i've heard this so it's not me me saying that this is true but i've heard this that they are not good at or don't have a desire to get into the nitty-gritty of sales and marketing so the insurance carriers the insurance companies they're not good at marketing this is what i've heard um but what i've seen is that whether or not they're good at it, it doesn't matter because they're playing at a bigger level and they think like billion dollar companies because they are. So instead of marketing and sales on an individual level, they're really thinking more in the terms of distribution and branding. And what does that equal? So distribution equals insurance agents via IMOs, FMOs, agencies, and wholesalers. So they're just creating the products. And instead of thinking about, well, how can I sell this individual product to a consumer? We need to have distribution for our products and do it at mass scale. And so they do that by contracting agencies to sell their products. That's where the next part's going to come in, which is the, the IMOs, FMOs, all of that stuff. Real quick thing that I need to talk about is what are contracts contracting in the insurance world? You're going to hear this a lot. So uh, in order to sell a product you have to get a contract from either a carrier or from a agency so whenever somebody says that they have their contract somewhere that's just who they are have a contract through to sell a product from a carrier so to break that down even more say i'm an independent agent we're about to get into captive versus independent but say i'm an independent agent and right now i'm just my own business i don't have the ability to sell anything okay i want to sell um mass mutuals life insurance i have to go through either mass mutual and get a contract from them or more than likely in what's usually a better scenario is i would go through an imo which we're going to explain in a second and get a contract through the imo to now be able to sell mass mutuals life insurance products so whenever anybody says contracts or contracting that's just basically their ability to now sell those products and who they kind of go through in order to do that. All right, captive versus independent. So captive, a captive agents, this is really a dwindling market, especially in the life and health space. Uh, these are employees that work for the actual insurance carriers. They're sometimes called career agents. So you're gonna see it way more uh, nowadays on the PNC side, which is property and casualty that's like, home and auto insurance, which we don't really focus on them at all. And I'll get into that at towards the end. But, you know, State Farm, there's State Farm agents, there's Geico agents, there's all state agents. Now they also have independent, but but it's just, especially like State Farm, that's a huge network of captive agents. They can only sell State Farm's products. They still do have them on the life side. So for example, like Northwestern Mutual, they're kind of, but pretty much they're captive. New York Life, if they're a New York Life in-house agent, they can only sell New York Life 
products. And they're also, they're really an employee. Some of them may have slightly entrepreneurial mindsets, but they're really handcuffed if they want to be full on entrepreneurs or business owners. So they're only allowed to sell the products for the company that they're captive with. So like I said, New York Life, Transamerica, Northwestern Mutual is kind of uh, Banker's Life, Penn Mutual. I believe they have career agents. Mass Mutual has career agents. One America has career captive agents. And then another one that's captive, but they're in a world of their own, and we'll get to them in the MLM section is Primerica. Then sometimes you have people that are captive to an agency. So the ones we talked about before, they're captive to a insurance company. They can only sell that product. But then you have people that are captive to an agency, meaning that the agency locks them down with a contract that they signed so that they couldn't go get contracts from somewhere else. So technically, they're more of an independent, but they signed a contract with an agency that makes it so that any company you want to sell, you have to go through that agency. So some examples of this would be like health markets, US health advisors, American income life. They're not actual insurance companies, but and sometimes they actually are owned by insurance companies, these types of ones. Um, like US health advisors is actually owned by UHC, United Healthcare. Um, and American income life, I'm pretty sure is owned by Globe Life, but they can sell multiple different types of insurance, but they can't go get contracts at a different agency to sell something else. They're, they're, locked down. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing. So sometimes it can be good because they're getting benefits that they wouldn't get anywhere else. And so it makes sense for the agency to lock them down so that they can't. So for example, if an, an agency is providing them uh, you know, a bunch of training or free leads or something like that, they want to lock it down so that person can't take the free leads that they're giving them and just go sell for a completely different company and the overrides would go to somebody else. So it, it can be good. It can be bad. Um, I'll just move on. It's not really that big of, a, big of a thing for what you guys are doing. Okay, independent. So independent agents have complete freedom. They can get contracts to sell products from multiple different places. So for example, if I was an independent, I could go get some life insurance contracts from uh, this one IMO over here. There's an IMO in Norfolk, Nebraska. I can go get some from them. I could get other life insurance contracts if I want from a, an IMO or an agency in Kansas. I, I have the ability to do whatever I want. Then I can get my Medicare contracts from somewhere else. I can get my annuity contracts. from. I have the ability to diversify as much as I want if I want to. It's up to me. It's completely up to me. Uh, they can run their business however they want to. So again, if I were an independent, I like nobody can tell me what marketing I can run. Nobody can. Now there's state rules and things that you have to abide by, especially in Medicare where there's state regulations, but you don't have somebody above you telling you you can or can't do this or that because you can go to FMOs, IMOs, all these agencies that want those types of business owners that they just give the freedom to do whatever they want. And this is really like the bread and butter of who we work with most. I'd say like 70% of the people are complete independents. They usually have their contracts through multiple different places. They're business owners. They're thinking like business owners. They're fully in charge of marketing. They're fully in charge of sales. They're fully in charge of hiring staff, running a team. They're, they're just full business owners. This is really like, in my opinion, for people that want to be entrepreneurs and business owners, full independent and a little bit diversified with your contracts is the best way to do it because you just don't ever get yourself in a sticky situation and you can run the business however you want. Um. Now, I just share that with you guys because that's my opinion. That doesn't mean that we won't work with somebody or tell them that they have to leave their company in order to work with us. That, that actually oftentimes is, is not a good thing to do because sometimes people want to work with us because they want to be the best at their company. Sometimes people are the best in their IMO or their FMO. And, and so just because those are what I feel is the least constraining doesn't mean that as a company, those are the only people that we work with. It just tends to be the ones that come to us that are like that have the most freedom and flexibility and don't really have to have any red tape that they have to go around. Now, um, don't have to subscribe to any certain business model, already covered that, have to get contracts. So usually through an FMO, NMO, IMO, which are all the same thing, we're gonna get in that in a second, or a large agency, still the same thing, could go, they could go direct to carrier, but by going through an FMO, NMO, IMO, or a large agency, they'll usually get higher comp, higher compensation and commissions 
and more support. So it really rarely ever makes sense to go direct to carrier. There are a few caveats to that, but for most, most of the time going through one of those makes more sense. Okay, so here's some weird caveats. So independent agents and agencies in most cases can still get contracts to sell for captive companies. So as I was saying earlier, like New York Life, for example, there are captive agents that can only sell New York Life, but an independent agent who can sell New York Life and Mass Mutual and all this stuff could go and get a contract to sell New York Life. Or if, you know, they can, they can the independent agents can still get contracts for some of them. Some of them they don't allow, but for most of them, and it's opening up more and more as we move into the future because these large companies are realizing that independent agents sell a, a ton of insurance. So that's why I put in here, you know, if you get big enough or make enough money, you command a lot of respect and pretty much get whatever contract that you want. Uh, so, you know, that's why if you're really wanting to think like a business owner and control all aspects, I really don't know why somebody would choose to be captive over independent. And now if you want to be employee, you just want to focus on sales. You just want to focus on selling the product, understanding the product and make, then going captive makes a lot of sense sometimes. But for the most, most people that we talk to, but more importantly, who we want to work with, we're really looking at entrepreneurs, business owners. All right. Types of products and how the agents think. So these are the main four that we focus on. There's a few others that uh, are kind of like case by case scenario. And we need to ask them more questions along the lines of like, you know, how, how much commission do you get paid when you make an average sale, things like that. But if anybody falls within these four, they're almost always going to be a good fit with one caveat, final expense insurance, which we'll get into falls within life. If somebody is new and they only sell final expense, they only ever want to sell final expense, they're probably not going to be a good fit for the mastermind. They're just typically the people, well, I'll just, you'll, you'll understand why I'll get into it. So right here's where I'm going to get into it. So life insurance and life insurance agency owners, this is the most polarizing camp by far. I think it's because the MLM world has really come into the life insurance more than anything else. Um, but it's, it's really split. And in, in the life insurance side, it's split by product. Not intentionally, but it's just kind of how it works. So there's simplified issue and then there's fully underwritten when it comes to life insurance. So simplified issue means that I could go talk to somebody right now based on their age and um, really just their age. And then you ask them a few, you just have to verbally ask them a few health questions, they could qualify for a policy, they could get approved today, and it gets issued, and then I would get paid tomorrow. That's simplified issue. You don't have to go through a process of fully underwriting the person, which usually involves a medical where a nurse comes out to them, draws their blood, really dives into the doctor's um, data and all of that stuff. That's on the fully underwritten side. So on the simplified issue side, the products that fall under that are final expense, which we'll get into what final expense is later. Uh, mortgage protection, which is really just a, a marketing concept. Um, but there's simplified issue term, which is almost always what's sold for mortgage protection. And then income protection. Those uh, These are all like kind of marketing concepts invented by direct response, direct mail marketers back in the day to create leads. The one that is actually a product is final expense. The other two are typically serviced by simplified issue term insurance. And we'll get into what the actual insurance products are later for you guys talking to agents, knowing the, the products isn't really that big of a deal. Um, on the fully underwritten side, this is where, you know, more of the, the more, the bigger companies that people have heard of when it comes to life insurance, if you're healthy, if you, you know, are gainfully employed, you're typically going to go with a fully underwritten policy because it's going to get you a lot better benefits. You're going to get uh, way more for your money, and it's usually going to be cheaper. The simplified issue is more for people that are kind of unhealthy, so they're going to pay more for it, and the companies just basically underwrite them as if they're super unhealthy in order to maintain the, um, the risk that they have to. So if you, if you, if you're a type of person that, you know, is most people, I would say, are going to fall under the 
the fully underwritten. There is a huge market for this though. Uh, people that are seniors that have never bought life insurance that I'm not, yeah, a lot of this stuff gets sold. I'm just saying, but fully underwritten for most of you guys that are on this call, like you would probably, if you were going to get a life insurance policy, you would probably get a fully underwritten policy through one of the big four companies would be most people's recommendations. Um, so with fully underwritten, the insurance company looks at all the data, the medical data, identifies that the person qualifies and what rate they qualify for. Uh, what falls under this are all the really like wealth building strategies. So cash value, whole life insurance, infinite banking strategy, index universal life, which are oftentimes called IULs. And I'll get into like what these things are later on. But the wealth plays that are combined with protection are all done through fully underwritten policies. Okay, so this is more how these types of people think. So on the simplified issue side, these people, they buy leads. They usually only sell these products because they haven't been taught or haven't done the research on the fully underwritten products. They're usually recruited into the industry through an MLM. So they believe that the best way to grow in really, they believe that the only way to grow oftentimes is just to recruit more people under them. And then they think that the way to salvation for them is better leads and recruiting and that's what's going to save their business or grow their business. And they really typically haven't been introduced to true business principles. Like, I mean, they, they usually get decent sales training. I'll admit to that. But they usually don't get top marketing. They're usually told to buy leads and outsource marketing completely. Don't even think about it. Uh, they really don't get trained on like how to hire people, how to like actually hire people. They get trained to recruit, but not how to actually hire people, how to manage people, how to manage a sales team. Any of those more traditional type business principles really isn't on this side of things. Um, you know, the best way to kind of, and the reason that like I've said a couple of times in here, uh, like real business versus not, the best way to really think about the kind of recruiting model versus um, the other kind of agency model where you have employees and all that stuff, which typically these fully underwritten people fall under. Um, is to think like outside of the insurance industry. So if you look at like a typical MLM company like Amway or something like that, people can make a lot of money in Amway, but it's just not through traditional business practices. They're not hiring people. They're not training them. They're not paying salaries. It's just through recruiting, 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 hype it up, get good at social media, get good at networking, all that stuff. That's really kind of like what's, what's happening on the simplified issue side and the recruiting MLM side. So. The other side, the fully underwritten products are, these are the types of products that have really been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. So you have more of like the purists when it comes to life insurance agents. Uh, they look down on the simplified issue products. They think that you're doing the actual people you're selling the products to a disservice. Oftentimes, uh, they've, they've almost always built their business off of warm market and referral. They're usually older and would crush it if they understood funnels and ads, but a lot of times they don't want to adapt to change. So that's life insurance and kind of how those agents think. Um, again, you guys are probably gonna wanna come back. You'll probably come back to this like once every two weeks, as long as you're selling and you'll pick up a new nugget every single time as you talk to more people, I guarantee it. This is like everything I've learned over six, seven years. So for you guys to pick it all up on this first run through, I'd be incredibly impressed. The next thing is health insurance agents and agency owners. So there's two main focuses for health insurance agents. And when I say health, this is under 65. As soon as people turn 65, they go into Medicare. That's a different category. So this is selling health insurance to, and Medicare is a version of health insurance, but it's just different. So this is selling health insurance to people that are under 65. So two main focuses. Um, some do both. I'll hit those two focuses here in a second. Uh, what I've noticed is that health and Medicare agents are usually decently business savvy, especially in comparison to a lot of the life insurance agents. And I think it's because there's way less of the MLM stuff going on on this side. So the ACA, so that stands for Affordable Care Act Marketplace Obamacare. We'll get into like what that is more down the road, but that's that's like the federally regulated health insurance that's available whenever you hear politics talking about health insurance. It's almost always this. It stands for Affordable Care Act. It's just the marketplace where people can go buy insurance on their own, but there's other, there's also agents that can get paid to do that. 
So how these, these agents think, they typically are buying leads. A lot of the times they do grassroots marketing. So they're working booths at grocery stores. Uh, some of them are like going to prisons because as soon as somebody gets out of incarceration, they qualify to like, they, they get their own special enrollment period. So they can be put into a plan no matter what time of the year it is. Uh, they go to events. Some of them will have learned some simple Facebook ads and Let's see. Health insurance and Medicare is more of a push product. Okay. So this is important. This is, this is how I think of things, right? So a push product is more of a commodity. Okay. So, and this is like, this is my own word. I don't think this is like, nobody else uses this terminology, push and pull, but a push product is something like, like a retail sales. Like somebody comes into a store, they want to buy a shirt. You know, it's just easy. Like you can just kind of educate them and sell it. Health insurance is that way because everybody needs health insurance. Same way, same thing with car insurance. Honestly, same thing with almost all PNC insurance. People only like buy that stuff when they need it. Uh, like I'm not going to go be persuaded to buy uh, renter's insurance if I don't have something that I'm renting, right? And I'm not going to be persuaded to buy health insurance if it's not something that I needed, which in America, with everything, the way things are set up, pretty, people pretty much need health insurance. So you sell push products with education because there's already demand for education because people need know that they need the product. They just don't know enough information to make the decision. Life insurance on the other hand is a pull product. So people don't need life insurance. Like as much as like some people's parents have maybe hounded them that it's a good idea. At the end of the day, people don't need life insurance. And so you have to use craftier marketing and sales techniques in order to educate them on the true benefits of having life insurance. And at the end of the day, people can still say no, and they aren't going to have any sort of like societal or um, like nothing bad will happen. Like if you don't buy car insurance, you're going to, you, you could get a ticket, you could get arrested. If you don't buy health insurance, you will literally have so much catastrophic debt if anything ever happens to you, if you get sick. It's like there's, there's societal and like things in life that will just happen if you don't buy those things. With life insurance, <laughs> you really just screw your family over. So like there's people out there that, you know, it's just something that people don't need. So it's something that you have to be craftier with. Um, point is with push products, it's easier to generate leads because you just educate. So um, that's why they've been able to figure out some, some simple Facebook ads. And uh, let's see right here for marketing. All right, that pretty much covers how ACA people think. Um, private health insurance. So they've gotten craftier with their marketing over the last several years. Uh, they usually have their, these types of agents usually have tried Facebook ads or some sort of like mass texting, typically to real estate agents. Uh, most of them still don't really understand marketing as a whole. So this is them adapting to technology, which is helpful, but still not great since they don't understand the underlying marketing concepts that are really needed. Uh, people that sell private insurance, private health insurance are usually younger, tech savvier. They're typically using social and TikTok to generate leads, using hooks such as people turning 26 that are entrepreneurs, hooks towards travel nurses, or people working the gig economy like Uber and bartending. So, like this is they're going after people that have jobs that don't traditionally give health insurance. And then another hook that they're using is that people that are successful entrepreneurs that are paying too much if they're on ACA. We'll get into the actual, like what the products are a little bit later, but that's really like how these agents think. Medicare insurance agents, agency owners, they tend to be the most business savvy of any other agent group, probably because it takes time and patience to grow the business. They're, they're pretty much promised, hey, if you stick in this business and really kind of like eat shit for three years, then you'll have $100,000 in renewals and you'll be able to have success. So when somebody gets recruited into the industry with that mentality versus, hey, come into the industry, I'm posting screenshots of me making 40K this month in revenue, even though it's not that much in profit, you can make 40K next month. Like that's what people are getting recruited in on the life side. So th the way that people are recruited in and like brought into the industry on the Medicare side is like, be patient for three years and then you'll have a business. It just tends to bring in the more business savvy types of people. And most of them have built their business off of referrals, in-person dinner seminars, direct mail leads, or possibly their warm markets if they're closer to the 65 age range. So if somebody's selling Medicare and they're 57 years old, they probably have a lot of friends 
or will soon that are going into that market. If somebody's selling Medicare and they're 30, they're probably not going to use their warm market. Uh, unlike life insurance, the two models below both sell the same products to consumers. It's just how, just different how they go about building their agency when they decide to scale. So on the life side, the recruiting and the employee side of things is differentiated a bit differentiated by product. On this side, the agencies are differentiated, but both the downline and the LOA employee agent model sell the exact same products. It's interchangeable. So oftentimes on the Medicare side, um, you know, people can have both. They can have both a downline and some employee agents. And that's 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 not a bad model. Um I've, I mean, a lot of the people that come to us have built a downline model and then they they learn what Josh has done and then they want to hire some employee agents to create a branch that's much more profitable. So the downline model is less profitable. It's a numbers and recruiting game. There's far less people that will become millionaires this way because you have way less control than the LOA model, but the ones that kill it will strike it big. So what do I mean by this? With an LOA model, you are hiring employees. They're becoming agents for you. You train them, you ramp them up, you give them marketing or tell them where to get marketing from. But ideally you would give them marketing and you train them how to do sales. You, you, you tell them when they're coming in, when they're working, everything. You just have control. So you really, with more control, more people can become millionaires because it's a replicatable process. The downline model, it's similar to, to MLMs. You kind of just get lucky. You, you recruit 50 people and maybe one of them crushes it. And then you start getting a small override on all the production that they create. And, you know, if you're the type of person that can go viral on social media, have a big social media following, or somehow you're really good at networking, creating relationships, or if you can go in to an already established agency and convince them to convert their contracts over to you, like those things work, but that's not really a very replicatable process in my opinion. Um, so that's kind of my thoughts. So the downline, most of the time, these people are really good at networking relationships. So they leverage that to get killers underneath them and then get overrides. They usually don't have the skills of marketing or managing a sales team. Otherwise, they probably would have done an LOA model instead or in addition to the downline. So then we have the LOA model, the employee agent model. So they know that they can create a great opportunity for talented people. It allows for healthy profitability that can be reinvested to continue to grow the business these types of people are business owner investor mindset. Okay, annuity agents, annuity agency owners, how do they think? So there's not very many annuity only or annuity focused agencies or really even agents for that matter. You have to be smart to have the main focus be annuities and most people aren't smart. At the end of the day, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's how the world works. You know, because after all, you're convincing people to move hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars into a financial product. So it takes takes a, either a really high swindling skill or you have to be very, very smart to be able to actually explain the product, know the product, understand it, have it be right for the person, and then explain it in a very simple way so that they decide to move forward. Uh, and, you know, agency or annuity people can mess up clients' lives if they're not smart and they don't understand what they're selling. It's, it's a, actually a really, really big problem. Most annuity sales come from people selling Medicare or final expense and then digging up some money once they already have that person's business. This is a much easier way to find annuity opportunities, and this is why you don't see many annuity-only agents or agencies. The agencies that figure out the marketing, seminar, webinar scripts that work make a killing. They crush it. But, you know, even if it's, even once somebody finds that, right? So there's a very specific person I know that has a annuity group very, very smart person. He's able to go in and take what he understands about annuities. He can sell them. He's also able to then turn it into marketing that's not boring. But the problem is that even if it's then given to other agents on a silver platter, even if he just gives them the script to his webinar, even if he just gives them the script to his seminar, most agents will still mess it up because they don't have enough product knowledge or ability to explain things simply in the sale. So even if they can take that marketing that's out there, they'll still oftentimes mess up the sale. So it still requires a very specific type of person, a smart person to be able to sell annuities. Most annuity focused agents have built their books off of referrals because they either don't understand how to educate about them in a way that's not boring or they're older and they're very adverse to adapting to scalable models that require technology. All right, so 
that's annuity agents, agency owners. All right, let's roll into the next section. IMOs, FMOs, large agencies, NMOs, MGAs, and GAs. All right, these things are all pretty much the same damn thing. They just have stupid names that they all gave them. They're, they're all made up names too, in my opinion. So IMO stands for Independent Marketing Organization or Insurance Marketing Organization, depending on who you ask. So that tells you it's made up if they don't even know what it stands for. This is usually on the life side. FMO stands for Field Marketing Organization. That's usually the same thing, but usually for health agents. NMO is National Marketing Office, sometimes National Marketing Organization. It's just more of a neutral term. Uh, so FMOs and IMOs who do business across the U.S., who may sell both life and health, they may call themselves NMOs. A BGA stands for Broker General Agency, basically an IMO. Uh, a large agency. So this isn't super important, but for, they may now be an IMO. For, but for a long time, I heard that FFL was not actually an IMO. They were just a really, really, really large agency. But again, it like who can tell if they're an IMO or not because it's all made up stuff. There are like different contract levels at uh, the carrier, but it's anyway, they're all basically the same thing. So some big name IMOs are actually agencies. Again, that doesn't really matter. From my perspective, again, they're all made up names. Pretty much they mean the same thing. Now, individually, not separate between like IMO versus FMO, but the actual companies will have their own benefits. So whether or not they're an IMO, FMO, or NMO doesn't matter. But like FFL versus Primerica, the agents are going to have a way different experience IMO to IMO. They're all going to offer, they're all going to have their own kind of like training that they offer. They're going to have their own proprietary leads that they offer. They're always trying to get better stuff to offer agents so that they can have the agents contract under them so that they can make more overrides. Um, so, but like it's, there's not really a point to understanding like what are all the benefits that any of these bigger name ones or even smaller name ones bring because it doesn't matter when we're talking to these people and even when they come in, it doesn't really matter. Um, and it changes all the time. And the biggest thing to know is that pretty much, no, not pretty much, none of them teach what we teach. A lot of them have tried, but I've never come across a single person that didn't come with us because they said their IMO gives it to them for free that we could talk to a year later and they actually have anything marketing wise built. So, they may tell you that their IMO does it or their FMO does it, but I've never seen it. And if they even try, it won't be close to the ability that we can provide IP wise, intellectual property wise and support wise. Uh, these are who are at the top when agents go to get contracts. So back to like the carrier side of things, distribution, they want to go to IMOs because then they just have to make one relationship. They're like, okay, we're going to go to you. Then you make all the relationships with the agents. You do all of that. And if anybody's ever ever hears the term wholesaler or wholesaler, they are just somebody that works for an IMO typically, or they work for the carrier and their job is to make relationships with IMOs. Because again, their job is distribution to distribute the products. So they need to make relationships with IMOs who then make the relationships with all the individual agents. And that's how the products get distributed. <clears throat> Uh, MGA is a managing general agent. So MGA, GA, and street are more of a contract level that fall under all of the things we talked about before. So if the insurance carrier is, is saying like, we want to have more final expense sales, let's go find an IMO that has agents that can sell our products. Okay. We found an IMO. We're going to give them 180% comp. So anytime they sell a product or any of their agents sell a product, however much premium came in in the first year, let's say it's $1,000, we're going to pay them 180% of that. So we're going to pay them 1800 bucks. Then the IMO has levels under them. So say, so the next would be typically like an MGA, then a GA, and then you have all like the, the boots on the ground level, which is typically street or sometimes even under. The MLMs have like 50 different levels, but these are more generally known levels. So we'll just carry that example out a little bit further. Um, so the, the IMO gets 180% compensation. Let's say the, the MGA is at 140% compensation. 
the GA is at 130 and then the street level is 120. So the actual street agent that sells it is going to get uh, $1,200. The GA above them that recruited them is going to get like a hundred bucks because they're at 130. They get the spread. They get the difference between the spread. Um, the MGA is going to get like a hundred bucks because they're at a 10% spread as well too because they're at 140. And then the IMO is going to get 400 bucks because they 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 get the 1800. So basically how it works is that the 1800 actually gets paid to the IMO. It's not actually like this because I think the carrier pays them all individually, but to think about it this way is the easiest. They pay 1800 bucks to IMO. The IMO has to pay out 1400 bucks to the MGA below them. So they get to keep 400. The MGA has to pay out 1300 bucks to the GA below them. So they get to keep hundred. The GA below them has to pay out the 120 to the agent that sold it. So this is where the overrides come in. So the G GA is making money for recruiting the street agent. The MGA is making money for recruiting some of the GAs. And then the IMO is making tons of money for all the agents they have below them because they get a piece of every single policy that ever gets sold. That's how the recruiting side of thing works. Um, this is a, a good article that kind of talks about it more in depth. I'll just drop it in the chat for you guys. Okay, perfect. So <laughs> perfect time to go into MLM. So this is why there are some really, really very MLM kind of almost pyramid schemey companies in the mix because it's set up to be able to do that. You know, there's, there's recruiting, there's levels that make sense, but then there's people that just take it to the extreme and where it becomes an issue is when their main focus isn't to sell insurance, it's to recruit and then have the person you recruited buy a policy on themselves. And that's how they sell insurance. That's when it becomes a problem. And that's when it becomes a pyramid scheme, in my opinion, because the company doesn't exist to sell insurance. The company exists to recruit people and then have the recruits buy the product that is just there to be there. Like that, <laughs> yeah. So there are a few out there that are like that. So uh, to go over these notes, not sure when it started or you know who, it's not sure when it started. It could have always been prevalent due to the easy payout structure from the insurance carriers to have downlines and make money from recruiting people that we talked about before. Um, but like I said, there are some companies where it's really bad. So Ryan started, he can talk to you guys about it forever. Uh, they are the main ones and they're not automatic DQs when you're talking to them, but you need to talk with them with a grain of salt and ask them some questions around what their goals are and make sure that they actually want to sell insurance because if they want to use our stuff to just recruit other people and then have those people just buy a policy on themselves and then that like they're just not a good fit at all for what we're doing here uh the companies above from what i've heard they all they'll book meetings with people then they'll bring on a manager or senior advisor or senior vice president any of these titles that they have they're going to bring them with them and then the whole meeting is pitching the person to come sell insurance on the side it's not even about insurance. It's pitching them to do you keep your options open to make money on the side. If you ever get a text like that, you can know it's from somebody that's selling you, trying to get you to do an MLM. Um, so they don't even sell insurance in the meetings. They just hype up the money-making opportunity. Then because most of them don't, they really don't sell insurance. When they do write a policy, it's usually putting the customer in a horrible policy. And I really just don't want to perpetuate these models at all. Uh, if they care way more about recruiting and not selling insurance at all, then they're not a fit. Okay, let's get into the downline, upline recruiting model versus the employee agents LOA model. We're gonna, we've talked about it a bit, but let's kind of dive into it a little bit deeper so you guys have a good understanding. So outside of the pyramid scheme, MLM stuff that have people that don't even sell insurance, you know, there are two main models that people really use when they want to grow their business. Both of these work for all the products that we're focusing on today, health, life, Medicare, annuities, both these models work. And if anyone doesn't think that they can do one of these models, it's just because they're with an 
IMO, FMO, agency, NMO, whatever, that will not accommodate it or has brainwashed them into thinking that that's not possible, which that happens. Uh, because oftentimes it'll be like, you know, it's a more profitable model to have agents that are employees of yours. You can put them as an LOA or you can just kind of split comp. There's multiple different ways to do it, but the model's the same. They're employees of yours. And they're like, well, my, my agency or my IMO doesn't allow that. Or they're like, I don't, that doesn't exist. You can't do that with life insurance. And that's not true. That's not true at all. Their IMO may not allow it, but if they're fully independent, they can get contracts from multiple different IMOs. And in my opinion, if an IMO is telling somebody that they can't do something, it's typically because they're trying to control people out of fear. So just my insights into that. Uh, and caveat for you guys, with all this stuff that I'm giving you, it's very insight into my mind. But that doesn't mean that we always let this stuff show on calls. Actually, matter of fact, we pretty much let none of this show on calls. You guys could do calls with people without any of this information. But it's good to just have it in the back of your mind so that if something comes up that you do need to combat or educate somebody on, you can. But just don't let it create ideas or thoughts about what somebody may be a good prospect or anything like that going through this stuff. It's just, it's just more good info to have. It's not guidelines as to like who we work with, except for the very specific things that I said, we don't work with them. Um, now, okay. All right. Upline, downline recruiting versus this LOA stuff. So like I said, outside of the pyramid scheme, people that, you know, don't even want to sell insurance, there's these two main models. So both of these work for all the products that we've talked about. Building a more traditional, you know, real business, as I as I, I like to say, uh, will create more millionaires than recruiting. With the few that are really good at recruiting, they could become hundred millionaires. So that's the difference, right? But you know, if you if you ask me, and this is just me, I mean, maybe there's people out there that don't agree with this, but I'd rather take a more consistent, controllable, and likely route to being a millionaire than a random, possible one in a hundred percent chance of being a hundred million millionaire. So that's why I really think that like for most people, the LOA model is a better model to success and it doesn't have to be one or the other. You could do both. Oftentimes doing both is actually really smart because if you build a strong LOA, you're going to attract people that want to do the same thing. And then you can have, you can just recruit them. Um, big key difference is that like for the LOA model, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself here, but with LOA model, you're hiring people that want to be employees. You don't hire them as employees if they want to be entrepreneurs. That doesn't make any sense. They're going to get pissed. They're going to, they're not going to flourish. They're not going to be in an environment that they want to be. But most people don't actually want to be entrepreneurs. They may think that they do, but then when they have to, uh, you know, be fully in charge of marketing, they have to be in charge of uh, their taxes. They have to figure out cash flow. They have to do all this stuff rather than just get really good at selling. You know, it just it just kind of differs. And I'm going to, I think I'm ahead of myself here, but. Uh, let's see. Yeah. That's the biggest thing is that through recruiting, very small percentage of people could become and have become hundred millionaires, you know, really building a huge agency and selling to integrity. There are several people that I've already talked about their agencies that have become hundred millionaires in the last two or three years, but it's, it's very hard to do what they've done. That's why there's only a handful of them. So, you know, as a company, we can help people that do both models, I believe that the LOA model is way more profitable and way more attainable for the masses to reach the goal of biz, of their business, making money for them while they sleep. So that's another, another piece of, of this puzzle is that, especially on the life side, everybody thinks recruiting is the magic key because if they recruit enough people that sell enough policies under them, business can just create passive income or can create income without them. But again, that's chance. Like you're not Really, unless you're super good at networking, unless you can get a really, really wide amount of people, but even still, you can get screwed by chargebacks. It's just really risky with learning skills that are very, very learnable because every other industry, there are people that learn these business skills. They're replicatable, they're doable. You can just calculate it, create a business that makes money without you. Josh has done it. We have an exact out, like a, a blueprint to how it can be done over and over and over again. So it's just, to me, I think it will create more millionaires and more businesses. It's just more calculatable to create businesses that work for the owners and creates good opportunity, really, really good opportunity for the employees. 
Whereas the recruiting model, if out of 50 people recruited, 49 of them fail, it's not really creating good opportunities for most people. Uh, Steve, you raised your hand. Yeah, is it cool if I just chime in on something real quick? Yeah, for sure. So on the MLM model, um, I, and I think I talked to you about um, this call a little bit. The, you know, she, she had 36 agents that she had recruited Right, and they're, they're all their own independent business owners. Now, they all got a bunch of them got caught up in a major fraud case with what they were pushing underneath her, and she got hit with the hundred thousand um, dollar chargebacks and, and chargebacks. So that all falls on her as the business owner. Like, so I don't, I I don't really see any benefit if that's if that's a probability because you can't control what these other people will do, especially if you're going to build such a mass amount of them. Like I was speaking to people, like, oh, I've had 56 agents, but they don't have any control because they're on their own business owners, but you're still liable for the, for, and people are always going to be like that. There are going to be people that are going to look to cut corners and scheme and be, and be disgusting. But like, if you're going to be responsible for that, then I don't understand why anyone would want that model at all. Like why wouldn't it all just be an LOA and build a business that you could actually structure and have control over yeah, I mean, it has to exist at some point. Otherwise, you know, I wouldn't be able to go get my contract somewhere to build my own LOA employee agency under. But the people that I get my contracts through, they have enough resources that if something like that happens, it's not a big deal. But for somebody my size or the agents that we talk to typically on a daily basis, yeah, it's a huge, huge liability and not really very calculatable. So yeah, that's the other part. And I think I'm going to get into that here is that you can get completely screwed by chargebacks because you have no control. They can go do whatever they want. So downline, they recruit agents to sell. You give them their contracts and then some training, usually some product knowledge, half-ass sales training, and tell them to go buy leads. Most of the agents will fail. One in 50 will do well. Any policies the agents below you sell, you get a cut commission on depending on your spread. This model makes sense if you don't have proprietary marketing or anything of value to train the agents with. This model is necess this is a necessity to be around for those types of people that are entrepreneurial. Most people aren't, but they think they are. Agents in the downline have to do all of the business owner things. They have to worry about marketing, cash flow, chargebacks, you know, insurance, sales, product knowledge, setting up their business, all of that stuff. And most people just aren't great at doing that. They probably would rather be given an opportunity where they can just sell and make a hundred or two hundred k a year, and you'll be happy because you'll be able to, they'll be able to do that on volume and you'll be able to keep a ton of the profits. Um, that's me speaking to the agents. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of my, my insights on the downline, the employee agent model, uh, usually LOA, but doesn't have to be. So LOA stands for licensed only agent. And what that means is that all their commission goes to the agency and then the agency pays them. So they just sign, they just sign their commissions and the agent, the commissions go into the business bank account and then the business owner pays them. It's very similar to like how basically every other business is set up. Like with you guys, you guys are my sales staff. When you guys make a sale, the sale goes into the business bank account and then I pay you. Creates a great opportunity for you guys, creates enough money that we can put into marketing to grow the company, all of that stuff. It's why every other industry does it that way. Um, so it's, it's proven in like every other industry and this industry, but it's not just like some, some idea that Josh and I are pulling out of, of nowhere and being like, oh, this is brand new. It's like, no, this is business 101 across the entire world. And half of the, no, like 90% of every single life insurance agent thinks you're an evil villain. If you ever even talk about running a business that way, it's just interesting for sure. Uh, so, but you want to hire employee minded people. So like you're looking for people that either want to be killers at sales. They just want to focus on sales. They don't want to do all this business owner stuff. A lot of times, like, uh, we have some clients that they focus on just hiring part-time moms to sell some Medicare policies on the side. Like those people don't want to be full on business owners. So there are people out there that are super grateful for an opportunity to make 80K to 180K, potentially 200, 300 if it's under a, an annuity shop. But like you're creating a real good opportunity for them because you're actually responsible for their growth. Otherwise, they're not going to stay as an employee of yours. Uh, and it can still be commission based. You're just doing it off of like a per sale or something like that. 
And it just, it creates a good opportunity for them, creates a lot of profitability for the business and it allows it to grow. It's, it's a win, 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 in my opinion. As long as it's run well, you can't be a bad business owner. Like if you're a bad business owner, none of these models will work. And you can start as a bad business owner, but it's something that you need to get better at. Like people aren't born good business owners, they're learned skills, but they're learned skills that are actually learned in other businesses across the board constantly. So they're easily learned skills. They're replicatable. They're things like that. You know, having a viral video that, that goes crazy on TikTok and now all of a sudden you got a bunch of recruits, that's not replicatable. That's not like a skill that everybody can learn. And even if it is somewhat replicatable, the algorithms are incredibly random. So it's not actually replicatable. So just the LOA side of things has built on a foundation of skills that have been taught and learned by people for years and years and years and years. It's very profitable for the agency. Uh, agents can make a great living too. With this side of things, you won't get effed by the chargebacks because all the money comes to you first. The agent isn't taking 90% of the commissions. They're getting a lot less and it's going back into the business where you can hold on to it and save it in case any chargebacks happen. You just have way more control. Agents can't just stop working or do whatever they want. You can actually control and manage them, their schedule, all of that stuff. People are scared of this model because you usually have to pay a salary. It doesn't have to be big. It can be small, but it means that the business owner themselves have to learn cash flow and know their numbers, which most agents don't at this point in time. I can talk about this topic literally for days, and I'll probably end up making a YouTube video about it at some point, but just trying to keep it simple and get you guys an understanding of the two different models. Uh, right. In-depth product breakdown and how much the agent should get paid. Now, here's a caveat. How much the agent should get paid is under the assumption that we are talking to agents that think like business owners. If they're an employee agent for another business or a captive company, we need to get the owner on the phone. We don't want to work with employee-minded people. They aren't going to pay for ads and they shouldn't have to. Their business owner should for them. So if they're an employee agent and they're getting on, they're like, I get paid 20% comp but they probably only have to sell and they probably get fed 10 appointments a day and they can still make 80 to 120 K. Like we're not going to sit here and feel bad for them that they have 20% comp. They're an employee. So instead of like trying to convince them, Hey, you should start your own business. You should become independent. You can get hundred percent compensation and make, no, just be like, let's talk to your business owner and let's just get you an even better situation. So just don't waste your time talking to employee agents unless they come to you and they're like, I do this. I've done it for a while. I like it, but I now want to branch out on my own. And that's why we're talking to you. Then cool. That makes sense. But they at least need to have a plan for how they're going to go independent and start their own business. So with that being said, this is how much people should get paid and like what commission should be for a business owner minded person. That doesn't mean that they have to have employees right now. They could still just be a solopreneur, but they, if they're a solopreneur, that is a business owner business-minded person, they are going to be responsible for marketing, sales, product knowledge, cash flow, all that stuff. So they deserve to make more money. So Medicare lifetime value to an agent should be 1500 plus. Um, so what is Medicare? So Medicare is regulated health insurance for people that are over the age of 65. There's original Medicare that pays for hospital stays and it pays for doctor visits but it only pays a certain amount. So there's a huge amount of liability if people don't get one of these other two things. So one is a med sup, which is a supplemental plan that can make original Medicare very, very, very good insurance. It's, doesn't, it's not really, it doesn't really matter, but it's usually around like 200 bucks a month on top of what you pay for, for Medicare. Uh, Medicare Advantage, on the other hand, is something that's sold as usually zero cost uh, or zero premium Medicare. It's a Medicare Advantage plan. It replaces original Medicare and a Medicare supplement. Your, your Medicare coverage gets outsourced to a private company um, like Aetna, UHC, like any of these health insurance companies. The government actually outsources all the coverage to them, and then you get coverage benefits. A lot of the times, this is being sold. I mean, not always, but a lot of times being sold to, to lower income folks because they don't have to pay premiums, but then they have a little bit more risk if something does happen compared to the med sub side. I'm getting kind of into it. This stuff doesn't really matter that much, but just understand that it's like it's it's health insurance and people need med sub and med advantage if they did only original Medicare. 
uh, they would they would be leaving themselves very open to a lot of damage through health bills and things like that. T65, so it's important to note, a lot of people are going to go after turning 65 because in the six months prior to your 65th birthday, you that's when you can start to enroll onto a Medicare supplement or into a Medicare Advantage plan. It is also the only time that you have guaranteed and guaranteed enrollment period, meaning that even if you're at 65 and you have cancer and you have everything wrong with you, you can't, you, you're guaranteed to get into a med sub. If you wait a certain amount of time after that and you have all these health problems and then you want to get a med sub at that point, which is really, really good coverage, you don't, you won't qualify. So that's why people hit this at, at the 65 range because everybody's coming off of their employer benefits and then they're getting into Medicare and on the Medicare Advantage side, it pays 600 rather than 300 sometimes. Uh, Medicare sale, but just for easy math to understand, a Medicare sale makes the agent around $300 a year recurring revenue. So if somebody has $350, 350 clients on their books, they should be at the point of $100,000 in renewals or it will be starting the following year. So that's just a good guide when you when you ask people like how many are on the books, especially for Medicare. Um, it really doesn't matter on the life side because renewals are so tiny. Um, but it's a good question to ask on the Medicare side so we can know what their renewals are. And because where their, renew, where their renewals are at is how fast and quickly they can scale to hit their goals. If somebody's at uh, you know $250,000 in renewals that are just going to hit Next year, no matter what, no matter what work you do or don't do, you are in a pretty good space to be able to scale because you don't have to make any money on any of the initial ad spend. You could just break even on year one and scale that thing infinitely because it's super easy to get a cost per acquisition sub 300. All right. Life insurance. What is life insurance? So life insurance breaks down into two different main topics, term and whole life. Term is going to cover you if you were to die during a specific term of time, say 20 years. So I'm 28 right now. If I got a 20-year term, it would cover me until I'm 48. Uh, it's, it's usually way cheaper than whole life, but it doesn't have some of the benefits. You know, why would somebody do that? Um, because it's cheaper and they only want coverage until their kids are through college or something like that or until they retire. Uh, oftentimes, term is mixed with whole life. Whole life covers you for your whole life. If it's a fully underwritten product and set up properly, it can also be used to build wealth. Same with IULs, which we'll get into here in a second, uh, because you earn cash value. And if anybody wants to learn more about that, you just talk to Ryan and he'll explain it way better than I ever will. Uh, ways people sell it. So these are kind of like different angles to sell these products. So you have final expense, mortgage protection. So final expense is uh, is actually a product. They did make it into a product. It's, you know, typically only 20,000 to 50,000 of death benefit, fully underwritten policies start at like lowest you can go is like a hundred thousand. And most people are getting millions of dollars in fully underwritten policies because there's a lot that, you know, people that have kids and houses and real estate and all these different needs that they would need. And if they passed away, that's, that's really, you know, when people are looking at life insurance for the main things that is really designed for uh, final expense isn't really going to cover it. So final expense is kind of designed for people that have never done life insurance. They've maybe thought it was a scam or just put it off their entire life. And now they aren't going to have enough money when they die for their spouse or their family to pay for their funeral. And so they just get like 20 or $30,000 of life insurance anywhere from age 55 all the way up until like 80 or something like that. And then uh, they just pay like a hundred bucks a month. They basically pay the amount that if they were to just put it in their bank account, they could create that much money, but it kind of covers them in case they were to die sooner. That's final expense really went into that probably more than I needed to. But um, then there's mortgage protection, which is a different way to, it's just a, a concept. So mortgage protection, the concept is, okay, I just bought a house. If I were to pass away tomorrow, my wife, she doesn't work. How is she going to be able to maintain 
making the mortgage payments without my income. Well, she's not because she, she a stay at home mom and she doesn't make any income. So if I were to literally die tomorrow, I do have a ton of life insurance just so we all know. But if I didn't, and my, my wife, and my kids would be in a really poor spot. So mortgage protection really just only focuses on the mortgage payments, even though there's, there's a lot more that needs to be protected than just the mortgage payments, but they would sell you a policy Oftentimes it's a term policy for the length of your mortgage. So if I have a 30 year mortgage, they would create the term to equal the 30 years to, if I were to pass away, the amount of money that would get paid to my wife would be enough to make those mortgage payments over the next 30 years. Sometimes they're going to sell what's called an ROP return of premium, meaning that I could pay into the policy for 25 years. At the end of 25 years, I get back every dollar that I put into it in a lump sum. That way I don't, you know, some people like that. Some people don't, some people you have to pay more for it. It's usually double the price of regular term. Um, people that are good with money don't want the insurance company to be reaping the rewards of that investment. But people that are not good with money, it can be a really good way to get all of your money back that would have otherwise just gone to nothing if nothing happens to you. So that's mortgage protection. Debt-free life is typically the product sold with debt-free life is a whole life cash value policy, but it's pitched in a way to use the cash value to pay off your debt. Infinite banking concept is using cash value life insurance as an alternative to a bank. So at a bank, you're typically getting like 0.01% interest on your money. If you instead were to put your money into a whole life policy, you'll earn cash value that's typically growing at 4% or more. That's not the end all be all play. That's not the wealth play. You then just use that and then you deploy it into investments like real estate and stuff like that. Same with cash value life insurance. A lot of times in today's world, people are just calling it cash value life insurance and then explaining the benefits rather than saying infinite banking, but you may hear both. And then an IUL acts similarly. An IUL is actually different than term and whole life. It is what is called universal life. And an IUL is an indexed universal life policy. So it's kind of a combination of term and whole life. And Ryan, if I'm not getting this perfect, don't worry. It's good enough for, for our sales guys. But it's kind of a combination of term and whole life. It can completely implode if structured improperly. And most people out there selling it, structure them improperly. But if it's structured properly, what it can do is it can have some benefits. It's indexed with the market. So if the market, but it has a cap. So if the market in 2023 goes up 20%, my, my cash value is indexed with the market, but it'll say it has an 8% cap. So I'll grow 8%. Then in 2024, there's a 20% loss. It protects you for a loss. You would never take a loss. So it's also, a, it can be a good wealth play. And I'll tell you when you're talking to people, don't ever have an opinion on this because the agents that sell these are very, very polarized with what they believe is the best. Sometimes you will, but very rarely you're going to get an agent that likes to sell both IULs in whole life. So whatever they want to come to you telling you that they want to sell, you just tell them that we'll, we'll help them with the marketing side of things. Um, all right. Steven, back in. All right, cool. Um, street level commissions are usually 90 to 130% depending on which of these products you're selling. If it's final expense, it's going to be closer to 120, sometimes 130. That's what like any agent off the street could walk in and get for commission. So when you hear people that are, that think they're an entrepreneur and they're a business owner and they're actually getting 40% commission, they are getting screwed. Um, if somebody's wanting to be an entrepreneur, they should and need to have high comp. If they're an employee, their comp may be lower because their business owner should be taking care of everything else. We really only want to work with the entrepreneur, business owner minded people with what we offer. All right. Uh, life insurance should be able to make this amount of money in first year commissions. Otherwise their marketing or sales skills are off. So for final expense, they should be able to make $750 to $1,000 per policy. Mortgage protection. Yeah, these are in order of how easy or hard it, from easy to hard in ability to sell and just like level of product knowledge and basically your skill as an insurance agent. Um, now, 
caveat, the last three are all equal. Those aren't in order. They're just, I would say, all equal. All right. So final expense should be able to make $750 to $1,000 first year commissions. Then you have renewals, but they're tiny. They're like 7%. So you get like 70 bucks a year. Um, and some get none. That's the other thing. <laughs> some IMOs don't give renewals at all, and then they keep all the renewals, and that's another way that they make money. Um, which is fine if you're an employee, but if you're wanting to be a business owner, your comp should be as high as it possibly can. Mortgage protection, fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred per policy. Debt free life, fifteen hundred to five thousand plus per policy, and then infinite banking, cash value life insurance, and IULs. They could you can make twenty five hundred to ten thousand plus per policy sold. Health insurance. All right, we have ACA and private health insurance. So ACA is good for people who don't have health insurance through their work. They aren't healthy or they aren't making a decent income. Which by decent income is just like sixty to ninety k. If you're making anything above like sixty to ninety k, depending on how many household members you have, you're probably not going to qualify for a subsidy which means that the government, a subsidy is when the government's paying for some or all of health insurance for you. Uh, commissions for the agents is 20 to $25 per month per head. And then you can sell ancillary supplemental plans such as dental, vision, hospital indemnity plans, et cetera, to create more cash flow. Uh, we don't give ourselves as agents, don't give feedback on what we think is right or wrong unless somebody's doing something unethical. Just say that to say, if anybody comes in that has sold health insurance before, you know, they may not want to sell hospital indemnity because ACA plans are typically fully, uh, fully fleshed out to cover everything. And it would just be an unnecessary sale. Regardless, we're just going to help the agents do what they do unless it's like completely unethical. Uh, with those add-ons, somebody could make about a thousand dollars per sale. I uh, could also sell them life insurance to get the lifetime value up. On the private health insurance side, this can be this, this, this can be captive through something like US Health Advisors, US Health Group, who is owned by UHC, or can be an independent and they can have their contract with companies like Manhattan Life, United Healthcare, National General, Allstate Benefits, et cetera. Good for, this is good for people, so who they sell to. It's good for people that, Ha don't have health coverage through their work. So both of these health insurance are people for people that don't have health coverage through their work. Uh, and then the person is healthy and makes a good amount of income and would not qualify for a subsidy from the government with ACA. So if they're making, so basically anybody that sells private health insurance, they're typically targeting like real estate agents or high ticket closers or not Uber, I don't know. Anybody that's going to have like a higher income but not have health insurance and be healthy because they can get them cheaper plans through private health insurance than they'd be able to get through ACA. All right. Annuities. What is an annuity? Sold to people getting close to or in retirement as a safe place to put money that is guaranteed to never take a loss, but can participate in gains. It will pay out payments to them in retirement. Uh, there's a bunch of different ones and how to structure them. You don't need to know that stuff in depth. There we go. Pays anywhere from 1% to 10% commissions. So if somebody were to move over 500,000, the agent is at 7% commissions, they can make $35,000 from one sale. That's why everybody is so interested in them, but it's also a lot to learn and an even bigger skill to be able to explain it simply once you learn it and an even bigger skill to be able to market it and not be boring like most of the people that sell them are, which is why there aren't many annuity focused agencies out there. Financial advisors. So sometimes we'll get at financial advisors. We can absolutely help them. However, they have a ton of compliance. So most of the time they don't want to deal with it. So financial advisors, money managers, RIAs, which is a registered. Dang it. I forget what it is. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, registered investment advisor, I think. Uh, they manage people's money. The most common structure for them is a percentage, usually 1% of assets under management paid out monthly. So if somebody manages a million dollars, they get 1% per year, no matter how it performs. So it could lose all the money and they still get 1%. That's just my own thoughts on financial advisors. Uh, so that would equal $10,000. Then they get it paid monthly typically. So if they, they 
we're able to get a client that wants a million dollars managed, they're going to get paid 833 bucks a month recurring for that. So they can make a ton of money, like a lot. That's why financial advisors are typically very wealthy because they're making percentage of everybody else as well. But there's so much red tape and compliance that very few of them are willing to go through the efforts to get things approved by their compliance side of things. So they usually stay away from advertising as individuals. Like they're an individual, their business, they usually stay away from it. They're usually growing it off of word of mouth because they can make so much money per client. It just works in order to scale. And they don't have to do a lot of actual work to manage the money. So they can have a lot of clients and they don't really need too much on the service side. Uh, but especially on social media. So you'll sometimes hear a lot of financial advisors will do like radio ads and things like that, but they just haven't adapted much the compliance side of things to social media ads yet. PNC is property and casualty. So home and auto, um, renter's insurance, office insurance, uh, just like any of that type of stuff. So as of right now, this moment, 2023, you know, who knows what the future will look like, but our methods don't work great for personal lines. So people that sell home and auto, their commissions are too low for it to, for them to be able to undercut the other people in the market because there's so much competition from the big carriers like Geico, State Farm, Farmers, Liberty Mutual. So if somebody comes in, they're like, I want to use your program to generate auto insurance leads or home insurance leads. We just, you know, don't have, I don't, I can't get them the results that they want. So we're just not going to sell those people in. Commercial PNC, on the other hand, can work, but you need to have, like the agent needs to be somebody who's forward thinking. The commissions are high enough to where it will work. But the caveat is that most PNC agents haven't worked leads and they don't really know how to sell, handle rebuttals or objections. They're usually just quoters. Like people, it's again, it's a push product for most of these things for PNC people. So people are like, just give me a quote. Whoever has the best quote gets the business. They don't have to call a lead and handle somebody that's like, who the heck are you? Why are you calling me? So with that, they're usually not trained to handle that, that type of skill. And so even if they come in and generate a bunch of leads, a bunch of appointments, they aren't good at converting them. So if you do get somebody that wants to do commercial PNC, we really just need to make sure that they're willing to learn or that they already have those sales skills. You need to prove it to us. All right. I don't think I'm going to be able to talk after this presentation. My voice is slowly going, but marketing options available that agents may have tried in order of marketing and sales skills and scale ability. So we're going to start from like zero skill where most people start out to the pinnacle. So warm market, a lot of agents never convert this. They don't try anything else. And then they quit like a lot, like the insurance industry, especially the life side is I think it's like 7% or 8% of agents succeed. There's actually a company called 8% nation because of that number. Um, so nine means 92% of people fail. And it's because of this, this is how they're, they're brought into the industry. They're hyped up on, ah, you can make 40 K next month. And then they are told to go make a list of 300 friends and family. And then it just doesn't turn into anything. They don't, try anything else and then they quit. Um, so this is actually what I, how I was brought into the industry. They company told me to make a list of 300 friends and family. And then what happens is that I set up meetings with them and then I'm supposed to bring somebody in the company senior to sell the actual insurance to. And then I sit there and I learn, which I did learn to be honest. I did learn a lot. Um, and then they split the commission with me. So I get 50% of the commission. Um, which I mean, I think that's fair, but really what it is, is it's a good business model for the company that recruits a bunch of people to then give them a list of 300 people to sell insurance to, not necessarily the agent that's, that's trying to learn because your friends and family aren't always going to be the best people that are interested, especially from some random person that may or may not be good at sales and you that is just getting started and learning things. Um, it's a great way to get started. It's a way to get started. Not a great way. It's a way to get started, but I don't think it's a great way. I think it is a great way for the senior agents to get in front of people. Ultimately, this is not scalable. 
Then next is referrals, referral partners, and centers of influence. So a center of influence is, I know this dude, he's super popular. He knows a bunch of people. I'm going to go make friends with him and he'll give me referrals. Or like if I decided, hey, my niche is doctors, I'm going to go make friends with this doctor because he knows a lot of doctors and then he'll give me referrals. That's like simplified version of centers of influence. So this is, there's a lot of emotion with this type of stuff because this is how everybody that is now old built their business. And any of the great insurance agents that have ever written books, like this is what they did. And so there's just a lot of emotion tied to it. You know, it was big in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s before technology really took over. Back then, advertising was only available news, TV, radio, other than direct mail, which we'll get into. And it required big budgets to start those things. So there was quite a big barrier to entry for small businesses. People to this day will comment on my ads and swear that if you're doing anything other than these methods, then you're a scam and you're not good at prospecting. They say things like serious agents would only do referrals, referral partners, center influence, and nothing else. But to be honest, like that's just ignorance and it's just people's unwillingness to change. I will, I mean, I see it firsthand that running ads, true marketing, all that stuff will crush this stuff long term every single time. But that doesn't mean that this stuff's bad. It doesn't mean don't do this. Uh, what it means is that don't do only these and then be unwilling to do anything else. That's just dumb. That doesn't make any sense because ultimately this just really isn't that scalable. Now, don't get me wrong. If you are the type of person that sells annuities and you make $35,000 per policy, or you're selling this type of life insurance where you can make 10,000 plus per policy and you get really good at this, you can make a ton of money. You can make a million dollars in a year. You can just on your own pen, being only you, not having employees, all of that stuff. I'm not going to sit here and say that you can't. However, I don't consider that scalable just because you can make a lot of money. And I also realize that when you do it that way, you are 100% the bottleneck in the business and you're just trading time for money. Granted, you're trading your time for a lot of money, but you're still trading time for money. So you can't create an actual business where your money and your time is disconnected, which is really the biggest thing that I care about and what I'm passionate about teaching other people. Because if I can't just go and like hang out with my family and still make thousands of dollars, then I need to work on something as a business owner myself, my opinion. All right, buying leads, direct mail leads. So this is like the next stage, direct mail leads, Facebook leads, internet leads. Uh, that's a stupid name because it's very vague because they could be generated through SEO. They could be generated through Facebook. They could be generated through Instagram. They could be generated through Google, YouTube. It doesn't matter. They're just lumping them all together and calling them internet leads, which is kind of a red flag to me, but this is kind of the next step. So good. It's good for agents that are starting out that don't really have sales or prospecting skills. If you can find fresh leads, this medium will, all right, hold on. Good for agents that are starting out and don't really have sales or prospecting skills. If you can find fresh, fresh leads, got it. Okay. It's good. If you can find fresh leads, the leads are never going to be good this way due to the nature of the lead vendor business model, because their goal is to make as much profit as possible, which means that they want to generate the lead for the cheapest amount of money and charge you the most amount of money. So just due to that nature of the business, they're never going to be good. But if you can at least find fresh ones that have been called a million times, it's a good way for agents to start. And, and really, it's, it's a decent way for people to build up their income to six figures. Now, once you get to six figures, it won't get you to seven. So once you get to the six figures and you've done that through leads, what you should do is take that money and invest it into mar some marketing that you control. So you'll create something proprietary that you'll now have a real reason that somebody would want to come work for you so you can grow and get your time back. So buying leads is a good way to start, but it's not a good way to continue or finish, especially for people that want to grow past just, you know, uh, grow an actual business and have it make money for them. Um, it's just not a good place to stay. I apologize. I'm getting a little bit tired, but we are almost done. All right. 
simple Facebook ads. And this is like what I teach for free on YouTube. So like Facebook lead form ads, this is good if somebody is below six figures and they can't find a source to buy fresh leads or if they just want to do it. <clears throat> there are people out there that maybe they have a source, but they just want to start learning a skill. They're not at the point where they want to fully build a full funnel and a presentation of video and all that stuff. They just want to get into it. Then this is totally fine. Doing some simple, simple Facebook ads. It's not scalable because you're in chasing people only mode. Um, with simple lead forms, people are often having, what happens is they'll run a lead form on Facebook. Facebook has everybody's data about everything they've ever done in their entire life. So it auto populates the user's name. So somebody will click on an ad, it already has their first name, last name, phone number, email already populated. And then the person just has to click submit. So there's very little intent. So it can turn into sales for sure, but the agent is then chasing and chasing and chasing, and they spend a whole bunch of their time just doing inefficient things. And so it becomes not scalable. So again, this is decent below six figures, but once you get past six figures, you really would want to upgrade your marketing. Uh, the next is posting on social, TikTok, YouTube, Reels, working Facebook groups. This is great for building your brand. It's great as a piece of an overall strategy and good for brand new and all the way up to eight plus figure businesses. This is something that everybody should be doing. You should never stop. But very few people actually do this. It's free to post. It's free to post on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram Reels, all that stuff. The only time it would cost money is if you are making money and you decide you want to hire an editor or a team or some other stuff to get this really going. But for the most part, it's a free, it's a free thing. So in the beginning, you know, you might as well do it on top of buying leads, on top of doing other things in order to just get your name out there and get some free people coming to you. And as you're getting bigger and you're implementing other marketing strategies, it's stupid to not post on social because there's so many users on social and it's the only way that you're going to really build your brand. It's weird if you only run ads and don't have some sort of like social presence. It won't scale by itself. The only way that it could scale is if you have, if you go viral, but that's random and not controllable. So it's not actually scalable just because sometimes it could scale randomly doesn't mean it's a scalable method. Those that go viral will crush it, but it's not replicatable. So it shouldn't be an end-all be-all strategy. Dinner seminars and in-person seminars, if done right, they can be really good. You invite people to a restaurant or an office to go to a or go to a senior center and present a seminar to educate and get people to book appointments. There's three problems with this. It's good, but there's still three problems. One, it's not scalable because it's in person. Most people that do these don't know anything about marketing and don't have a coach. So if they try to make their own presentations, it's usually boring and it sucks. If somebody makes their own presentation and it's good, then this method is fire. Very few people are able to do that without some sort of like coach actually helping them that has really good marketing skills. Since they don't make their own presentations, they're usually going to get it from their upline and IMO, or they're going to Google it and it's going to not be custom to them at all. And they usually will just convert. Okay. So a lot of people end up doing the same presentation. There's, there's no differentiation between them and it's very educational. So it doesn't actually bring in their own stories, their own experiences, their own authority. Uh, so it works. It works. Okay. It's not great. It's still profitable though. And it can make an individual agent pretty wealthy especially if they can find presentations for annuities or large life policies. But it's not possible to scale and have multiple agents working this because it's in person and that it's, it's, I mean, you could have multiple agents doing it, but it would eventually saturate it and it's not anywhere close to as scalable as having it be and taking it online or doing this in tandem with online. So when I say online, I'm talking about this. This is the pinnacle. This is really what we teach, uh, the full on marketing funnels, emails, making social content strategy. So unless somebody has already learned from Josh Lustig or I, there are very few people who have executed this stuff well, just by like self-learning, but there are some, and they're all at the top of the industry in their niches. So there's a guy named Justin Brock. He's just trial and error with marketing. He's the top when it comes to Medicare. And, you know, he's very well known. If you just go into any of the Facebook groups, he's going to be known. Josh Lustig, clearly, Digital BGA. They've all, they're all at the top because they've gone and learned this stuff and they've gone ahead of the pack and they've learned it and they understand how powerful it is. Now, there are companies out there that consult, but from what I've seen, they don't consult on all of this. 
Now, there's not all of them, but most of them just teach or help with or even do a done for you version, but they're only doing what I teach on YouTube. So just simple Facebook lead form ads and a few text automations or maybe an appointment setter. So there's like other consulting companies in the space helping people, but they're not helping them on like this full marketing strategy of people coming to you and really turning it into business that works for you. Uh, so full on marketing, in my opinion, is about attracting people to you and your business specifically and having them know who you are, differentiating yourself from all the other millions of insurance agents out there. And that part is your marketing. And then using funnels and videos to educate the market to solve problems for the market, automated, so you don't have to do it in person, and building your brand to grow your market and building your brand to your market the whole time, creating this massive vortex or snowball effect that just keeps growing and dominating the niche that you're in. In a very simplified way, this is what we do. And we do it from real world experiences, working with and learning from hundreds of agents and testing things in real life in Josh Lustig's multi seven figure agency. Boom. The end. <laughs> that was so long. I should have broke that up into.